You may have just begun your DevOps journey, or you're already killing it as a technology professional. Either way, it always helps to have a guide you can turn to for answers. So say hello to the DevOps Handbook, the mother of all handbooks and the ultimate guide for every DevOps and IT professional. In today's video, I'm going to review this tech Bible that's spread across six parts and 23 chapters, and I promise to keep it as simple as possible. This is the third video in our book review series, and we've already talked about the Phoenix project and the Unicorn project, which you can check out on the playlist that's uh, given right here. So let's just jump right in. It all started back in 2011 when four friends came together to take on a big challenge to create an A to Z guide on all things DevOps. And these were not just any four friends, they were Gene Kim, Jess Humble, Patrick Dubois, and John Willis, icons in the DevOps community. What started as an intense brainstorming session over Skype calls turned into five years and 2000 hours of hard work. And finally, the DevOps handbook was published in 2016 and the rest is history. Now, it's not easy to write a reference guide for DevOps considering how fast it's evolving, but this book has covered as much as possible. Plus, it's readable and practical with lots of real life examples. The DevOps handbook also inspires readers with something called aha moments. These were innovations that the authors have seen or been part of, which made them realize the power of DevOps. And with this book, they want to equip you with tools and techniques to create your own aha moments. Now, before I talk about everything that this book covers, I wanted to tell you that this has been my go-to guide for years. Whenever I had to solve a tricky work challenge or wanted to brush up on my basics, I turned to the DevOps handbook and that's the beauty of it. You don't necessarily have to read it from start to finish in that order. You can use it as a ready reckoner whenever you want. Now, the book is organized into six parts. The first part starts with a brief history of DevOps, its core theories and how it has evolved over the last few decades. It also introduces the principles of the three ways that we discussed in the Phoenix Project book review. Watch it here if you haven't seen it already. The second part talks about the concept of value streams and the practices related to it, with plenty of case studies, anecdotes, and experiences. From there, parts three, four, and five tackle the three ways one by one in greater depth. And the sixth and the last part explains how to achieve security and compliance goals. It inserts the term SEC in DevOps well before it was even known as a thing, DevSecOps. Now, if you've been following the series, you'll remember that our review of the Phoenix project mentioned the three ways, which are the core principles of DevOps. In this book, we learn how to implement them. But before that, you get a quick recap on part one. So the first way is about creating a faster, smoother flow of work from left to right, your left to, to right, or development to operations, and finally to the customer. The second way highlights the importance of constant feedback to catch errors and fix them before they cause disruptions. And the third way shows how important it is to have a culture of learning and risk taking for an organization to get a competitive edge. In this part, the authors also share the benefits of applying lean principles to the tech value stream. Now, hold on, what are these lean principles and why are they important here? So the lean manufacturing method was born in the Japanese auto industry and was made popular by Toyota Motor Corp in the 80s. A fundamental concept of lean is value stream mapping. This is a powerful technique that can be applied to technology as well. In DevOps, the technology value stream is all the steps that transform a business idea into tech enabled service to deliver customer value. And when we apply lean in DevOps, things like deployment lead time and processing time become important for measuring the value stream performance. Now, the lead time starts when a work ticket is created and ends with fulfillment, but the processing time only starts when the actual work begins. So it doesn't factor in the wait time. To keep lead times as short as possible, it helps if we divide work into small batches. The idea is to build quality in every step of the value stream while reducing wait time. But what about scenarios where lead times run into months? It's pretty common in large organizations with tightly coupled architecture and complex approval processes. In this case, Reducing delays requires heroics at every step of the value stream. We'll talk more about this in a bit. So the dream, however, is to have a deployment lead time of minutes where problems are quickly detected and rectified. And it is possible by constantly checking small code changes in the version control repository while simultaneously testing before deployment. This way, errors are caught and fixed quickly and the change 
almost always work in the production environment. Unlike the fiction-heavy Phoenix Project, this book is more straightforward. It wants to help businesses boost profitability, elevate work culture, and increase productivity by combining lean and the three ways. So let's come to the first section that explains the first way. Here, the authors share tips related to lean method to speed up the flow of work and increase quality and agility. So tip number one, make our work more visible. You can't speed up something that you cannot see. But here's the tricky part. Tech work is pretty much invisible. Unlike in manufacturing, you don't move any inventory physically. Everything gets done with a click of a button. But with such ease of transferring, work tickets often become ping pong balls between the teams. Plus, the lack of visibility means that issues go undetected until they impact delivery or cause failures in the production environment. The solution is to make your work visible using, for example, tools like Kanban boards. In Japanese, Kanban literally means a visual sign. It's a popular lean system to visualize the workflow and identify bottlenecks. On Kanban, tasks are represented by physical or electronic cards. Work starts from left to right, flows into the work center, and is only considered done when it reaches the right side and the application is running successfully. Tip number two limit work in progress. Work priorities frequently change because of urgent customer requests and escalations. And there's no way to know which work to prioritize and as there's no visibility of how work flows through the system. In DevOps, by making work visible, say using Kanban boards, it limits the number of tasks performed by a team or an individual in each stage of a workflow and thereby reducing the work in progress and reducing multitasking. Tip number three, reduce batch size. Now executing small batch sizes is another surefire way of improving workflow and quality and cutting down lead times. In DevOps, we do this by making small code changes into version control, testing them and getting them into production as quickly as possible. So that's smaller changes to test, smaller changes to production and smaller changes to check quality and for integration. Tip number four, reduce the number of handoffs. Handoff or context switching is where a task is moved through a lot of different hands or people in order to uh, reach a completed state. Now, when you have a lot of perspectives, opinions and concerns input into a product, it is diluted over time. The problem with too many handoffs is that not only it increases lead time, but also the risk of losing critical product information. Teams become headless chickens and have no idea what they're doing and why they're doing or how it all fits together. To solve this, the authors suggest automating a majority of processes and making a single team responsible for delivering value to the customer directly. Now moving on to tip number five, which is about eliminating waste. To become lean and agile, organizations need to eliminate every type of waste. Yes, there is more than one type of waste in a value stream, like incomplete work or manual work or unnecessary processes and features and heroics. Yeah, even heroics, if work requires constant firefighting, it's bound to take a toll on productivity. The next part tackles the second way, which is about creating feedback and fast forward loops to make work systems safe and resilient. Here are some suggestions that the authors make. Number one, see problems as they occur. We can do this by having a fast, frequent and high quality flow of information throughout the tech value stream. You want to be able to gather, analyze and interpret data in an effort to understand system performance. This is where telemetry and observability comes in. Telemetry is the process of gathering and transmitting data from remote locations or machines to a centralized system. It includes metrics, which measure performance and response times and observability concepts which allow for better understanding and analysis of systems by providing visibility into their inner workings. Telemetry can be used to gather information about system performance, user behavior, network traffic and other factors that can help inform uh, decisions about how best to optimize a system. Now, not only does this help in catching defects and quickly resolving them, but it also prevents them from happening again. Number two, swarm and solve problems to build new knowledge. In Toyota's manufacturing setup, every work center has an and on cord that needs to be pulled whenever something goes wrong. Now, if the issue is not resolved within a fixed time, the production line is halted and the entire organization unites to fix it. This swarming stops the spread of problems to downstream work centers. It also prevents the loss of critical information needed to diagnose and treat the problem, particularly upstream, where it is probably easier to fix. Now, coming to number three, keep pushing quality closer to the source. More often than not, responses to accidents and incidents follow a top-down approach. We end up waiting for approval from busy executives or committees who don't have a clear picture of the problem. And instead, what's needed is giving quality and safety responsibilities to the developers engaged in the actual work. It not only improves uh, outcomes, but also encourages learning, 
for the teams. And number four is to enable optimizing for uh, downstream worker centers. There are two types of customers, the external one who pays for the service that we deliver and the internal customer or the work center that's next in line. So according to Lean, whoever is next in line should matter more to us. In other words, our efforts should be focused on designing and optimizing operations for the next work center as the end customer, even if that's an internal customer. By doing this, we build quality proactively and at every step of the value stream. Now, let's move on to the third way, which talks about the importance of a work culture that builds trust and encourages experimentation. But this can only happen if we create a blameless environment that focuses on learning from success and failures. As organizations become more complex, accidents end up being investigated only when they affect the customer. And then begins the ugly blame name and shame game over who was responsible. The technology value stream is fairly complex. Here, problems and failures remain hidden until they impact the customer or cause major disruption. In this section, the book refers to the organizational typology model by American sociologist Dr. Ron Westrom. According to Dr. Westrom, there are three types of organizations based on how they process information and react to failures. Number one, pathological organizations, where threats and fear rule, new ideas are crushed and failures are brushed under the carpet. The second type is bureaucratic organizations. They have too many rules and processes, new ideas are overlooked and failures are met with punishment or mercy. And finally, the third are the generative organizations. Here, information is actively sought, responsibilities are shared, new ideas are encouraged and failure results in reflection and inquiry. No prices for guessing which type of culture is best. Every organization should aim for a generative culture. It creates safer work systems and fosters a culture of learning. And if any accidents occur, the inquiries usually focus on preventing them from happening again. To sum up, a generative culture delivers value and quality to customers, keeps the workforce motivated, and edges out competition in the marketplace. I call that a win-win-win. Another part of the book that really resonated with me was the section titled, Enable Every Team Member to Be a Generalist. Now they say too many cooks spoil the broth, but when there are too many specialists, any task involves several handoffs, causing long queues and even longer lead times. Instead, every team member should be encouraged to become a generalist. Now we can do this by offering ample learning opportunities and rotating people through different roles. The authors quote the example of CSG International, which cross-trained and transformed engineers into generalists. It ended up dramatically improving workflow and fast-tracked career growth. Organizations might also want to change their hiring practices to onboard more people willing to acquire and use new skills. Now, investing in the development of employees they already have is a powerful and cost-effective way of making company future ready. Now, I also really liked the section on how keeping team sizes small can help in creating a high-performing organization. In 2002, Amazon introduced a two-pizza rule to trim team sizes. According to this rule, a team should only be so big that it can be fed with two pizzas say five to 10 people. And what this does is one, reduce how much communication is needed to give the team clarity on what they're working on. Number two, control the rate at which the product or service evolves. Number three, empowers individual team members and boosts productivity. And number four, help employees get leadership experience in an environment where the failures don't trigger severe consequences. So simply put, small teams work fast and deliver great results when they're empowered, especially if given feedback from people who use their codes or applications. So by now, I'm sure you can see how much uh, I rely on this book. And frankly, even in this detailed review, I could only manage to share only a few of my many learnings. That's why I highly recommend you start exploring the DevOps uh, handbook yourself. It's so simple, readable, and insightful that anyone who wants to understand DevOps must get a hold of it. There are so many case studies from companies of different sizes throughout the book that are very insightful. Now there's also a dirty secret the book reveals at the end which requires a mention. The authors state that while most of the time many of the practices described in this book were promoted in organizations where they were implemented, in some cases at least there were rollbacks because of change of leadership and the people involved in the movement leaving. So there's a lot of risks to be taken and the authors remind us that if you haven't managed to upset at least some people in management, you're probably not trying hard enough. So don't let your organization's immune system deter or distract you from your vision. As uh, Jesse Robbins from Amazon likes to say, don't fight stupid, make more awesome. If you like this review, uh, give us a thumbs up and leave us a comment below and we'll be sure to bring you more videos like this. Also do subscribe to our channel because we have many more reviews coming up. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.